Welcome to our 2018 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. Our webinars are also brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The goal of this webinar series is to share guidelines-based information and resources and address the mission of Allergy and Asthma Network to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. This is Sally Schessler, the Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network, and today we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Rushi Gupta, who will talk to us about school food allergy issues, plans, policies, peers, and pizza parties. Rushi Gupta, MD, MPH, is Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and a clinical attending at Ann and Robert H. Lurie's Children's Hospital of Chicago. If you can advance the slide, you can see her smiling face. She has more than 15 years of experience as a board certified pediatrician and health researcher and currently serves as the director of the Science and Outcomes of Allergy and Asthma Research Program, or SOAR, where she's actively involved in clinical, epidemiological, and community-based research. Dr. Gupta completed her undergrad and medical education at the University of Louisville and continued on to complete her medical residency at Children's Hospital and Regional Medical Center at the University of Washington in Seattle. She completed her Pediatric Health Services Research Fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and received her Master's, Masters of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Gupta is nationally recognized for her groundbreaking research in the areas of food allergy and asthma epidemiology, specifically for her research on childhood food allergy prevalence. She has also significantly contributed to the academic research surrounding the ec economic impact of food allergy, pediatric management of both food allergy and asthma, decreasing emergency department visits and hospitalizations, improving the quality of life of children and caregivers, and implementing community interventions in schools for students with food allergy, asthma, and other health conditions. Dr. Gupta is the author of The Food Allergy Experience. She's written and co-authored over 70 peer-reviewed research manuscripts and has had her work featured in major TV networks and print media. Dr. Gupta continues striving to improve the lives of children and their families through her research and hopes to continue finding answers and shaping policies, policies surrounding pediatric food allergy and asthma. Dr. Gupta, Gupta, you're a champion for your patients as well as for the network and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much, Sally, for having me. I'm definitely honored to be here today and excited to share some of our data with everyone participating. Well, go ahead and get started. Yeah. All right. So um, my intention today is to provide you with some of our latest data on uh, food allergies in general, but then specific to school policy issues. Uh, and I look forward to your questions towards the end. So let's get started with some information on food allergy prevalence. Now, this is a study uh, we conducted back in 2009, 2010. It was a study of 40,000 uh, children across the United States uh, trying to estimate the prevalence of food allergy. And what we found was that 8% of US children have a food allergy. That's about one in 13 kids, about two per classroom. And 40% were reporting a severe allergic reaction and 30% reported being allergic to multiple foods. Now here's a breakdown of what we found. So of kids with food allergy, we found the top eight to be the top eight. So peanut, milk, sorry, I, I feel like it, um, the slide's a little off, but you can still tell it's peanut, milk, shellfish, tree nut, egg, fin fish, wheat, and soy. So these eight foods make up the, what we call the top eight. Now, kids can be allergic to anything. Uh, however, these eight foods account for about 90% of food allergies in the United States. Now, this slide breaks down those same eight foods, but really goes into the age distribution. And I think what's interesting here is we all know, you know, peanuts, are pretty prevalent throughout, but milk was really interesting because you see this high prevalence 
in the younger kids, 31% reporting a milk allergy in ages zero to two. And then what's also very interesting about milk allergies is that we don't see, you know, in that adolescent population, the greater than 14, you see a lot of uh, kids holding on to their milk allergy. So, you know, you still see 18% reporting a milk allergy. So, you know, we previously thought and, you know, that egg and milk are two foods that kids often outgrow or develop tolerance to. And what was interesting about this data is we found that that did not seem to be the case with milk. Uh, and then you can see shellfish. Shellfish, you tend to see that increase uh, as kids get older, and this is probably because they're they're trying it more frequently at older ages. I'm gonna go on to severity. So uh, we also asked these families about their kids and if they had, you know, all the symptoms they had had from their food allergy. And then we classified it into severity categories. And what we found was that almost 40% were reporting having already experienced a severe allergic reaction. And I think this is really important when we talk about, you know, the morbidity associated with food allergies. And then when we looked at how that severity played out, you know, it was highest in tree nut, peanut, then followed by shellfish. But what was really, really important is that all these foods caused a severe allergic reaction. And, you know, one out of three kids with milk and egg allergies were reporting a severe allergic reaction. And the reason that's so critical is because we need to make sure people understand that it's not just peanut, you know, that any food can cause a severe anaphylactic reaction. Now, we then mapped these kids across the United States, and this is what the map looked like. So the lighter colors are lower prevalence, and then the darker colors are the higher prevalence. Now, there was no real association we could find from this map. However, if you look at this slide, what you'll see is uh, the geographic variability by population density. So this is similar to what we see in other common atopic conditions that are also related, like asthma where you see higher prevalence in urban areas. And we found the same thing for food allergies. So if you lived in an urban center, you see you had about a 10% chance of um, having a food allergy compared to rural areas where it was about 6%. Now, when we tried to look at associations by race and income, this was also very interesting because you know, it, I was very curious why in this, this world of atopy where you have asthma and we see all these disparities, we were not seeing them in food allergy or, or we were not observing them for some reason. And what we found in this data was that, you know, black children and Asian children had higher odds of having a food allergy, but they had lower odds of actually being diagnosed by a physician with a food allergy. And Hispanic children actually had similar odds of having a food allergy, but again, had lower odds of being diagnosed by a physician. What was really interesting is the household income, because if you lived in a household of less than 50,000, you had a lower odds of having a food allergy and lower odds of being diagnosed with a food allergy. All right, I am gonna share with you some hot off the press data. Uh, from our more recent prevalence uh, data collection. So we collected this data in 2015, 2016 as a follow-up to understand, you know, how these trends are looking and what's changed. And I'm gonna give you a sneak peek into this. So similar um, approach as our last survey. And now what we found in childhood food allergy, uh, what was interesting is you still had the top eight, but now we we did include in this survey very clear uh, information about sesame allergy. And so it did turn out to be the number nine allergen uh, in the United States. So that was really interesting. Um, as you can see, the overall prevalence still have it about 8%. Um, the overall physician diagnosed prevalence was about 5%. So uh, we still have a substantial number uh, not getting a formal diagnosis for their allergies. Now, this is really interesting because we, for the first time in this survey, asked about emergency department visits 
And we asked about lifetime and the past year. And lifetime ED visits, uh, 42% uh, reported that their child had been to the emergency department at least once in their lifetime. And then when we asked about past year, almost 20% were reporting having gone to the emergency room in the past year. So one in five kids with a food allergy are going to the emergency room for anaphylaxis within a year. And I think this is a very important number because uh, we really need to show that this is a serious condition and the morbidity has not been completely well understood. So if you have a food allergy, you know, how often does it actually impact you? And so this number um, really shows that and gets at that. Now, for the first time, we actually looked at adult food allergy prevalence. And I know we're here to talk about schools, so I'm just going to quickly glance through some of these numbers for you. Um, in adults, food allergy was also very prevalent. 13% uh, is what we found, but overall physician diagnosis was closer to 6.5%. The top food allergen in adults was shellfish, followed by peanuts and then milk. So when we talk about milk hanging on, it is still hanging on in adults with food allergy. Roughly half of food allergic adults reported developing at least one of their allergies after the age of 17. So this goes to the new onset food allergies that uh, are we're hearing about, but now we have some numbers to quantify. And then adults uh, going to the emergency room, about 40% reported uh, a lifetime emergency department visit for anaphylaxis, and only 9% were reporting a visit in the past year. Okay, so getting a little bit into anaphylaxis, I know most of you on the call are, are probably very familiar with this, so I will, I will just quickly give an overview. So anaphylaxis is a severe, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction that typically occurs within seconds or minutes of exposure to the allergen. Uh, usually it includes more than one body system, but can also be one with a drop in blood pressure, narrowing airways, blocking of normal breathing. I wanna show you, uh, you've probably seen this. This is put out by the Allergy and Asthma Network, and I think it's a very nice depiction and graphic of uh, all the areas um, that food allergy can impact, all the body systems and um, also what to do in case of an anaphylactic reaction. So uh, it's just a very, very good resource and um, easily accessible if you need. All right, we're gonna talk briefly about epinephrine. So epinephrine is a hormone, uh, adrenaline, it's, it's a very common hormone produced in your body naturally. Um, what it does, whoops, sorry. What it does is uh, allows blood vessels to contract and become less leaky, smooth muscles around your lungs to uh, relax, maintains your blood pressure, and it opens your airways. So, of course, you know, in the event of anaphylaxis, an epinephrine autoinjector is the first line of treatment, and antihistamines during anaphylaxis are not effective alone. So, again, when do you use it? First line treatment. Uh, very, you know, not, I haven't heard of any harm from using it, so it's very important that when in doubt that you utilize it. Um, strongly recommended, again, for airway, respiratory, cardiovascular compromise, two or more organ system involvement. These are, this is how epinephrine works. So, again, it has alpha adrenergic effects, beta 1 and beta 2. And I won't, I won't get into this, but I want to have it there for you if you want to review it uh, after this is all posted. Um, next, how important it is, you know, with identification of symptoms and then uh, having a plan in place for all children with food allergy. This is a very, very important part of, you know, their school plan to have an action plan on file at school. This is one, it's the FAIR action plan. There's many others. Um, and then again, this is the anaphylaxis criteria. This is another uh, nice depiction of anaphylaxis, a visual. 
And then now we have a choice. So there are four epinephrine auto injectors that I know of currently on the market. And so you will have in the school setting children with different auto injectors. So the positive is we have a choice. Um, the thing that we have to make sure of is that people are trained on all the different auto injectors. They all work slightly differently. Okay, now I want to get into what we're here for today is to talk about policies in schools. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about um, an anaphylaxis registry in schools. So, uh, you know, as we know, food allergy impacts two kids, about two kids per classroom. That's why it's so important to document allergic reactions in schools in order to help in managing food allergic reactions in schools. So we had developed an online tool to assist school health personnel in tracking the characteristics of allergic reactions occurring in schools. This online school allergic reaction registry was developed and implemented at three Chicago schools during the 2016-2017 school year. All allergic reactions in participating schools were recorded by the nurses, uh, tool evaluation, quarterly interviews, and we did a final written survey with the nurses. So our goal with this was to help nurses actually develop something um, that was easy to use for them in identifying patients that had anaphylaxis in schools and then um, identifying all the, all the things that went around that anaphylactic event. This is what it looks like, which is a terrible picture, at least on my computer. I don't know if it is on yours, but um, it is a, uh, a series of questions about their anaphylactic event. And I apologize for the poor, uh, the poor look of this, but if anyone is interested in this or would like it, I'm more than happy uh, to send it to you. So just please reach out and I can, I can get it to you. Some of the schools put it in their electronic reporting system and some did it on paper. So we had three schools participate in this, um, school A, school B, school C, we'll call them. And that's the breakdown of elementary students, about 10%, middle school students, high school students, and then overall. Okay, now um, this, I'm not gonna get into in great detail, but 20, basically over the time period, there were 20 allergic reactions that were reported. 25% of the reactions were classified as anaphylaxis by a school nurse, and 30% of all allergic reactions, the student had a prior history of anaphylaxis. Okay, so here you can see skin symptoms were reported in 65% of the reactions. Whoops, I apologize for that. There you go, yeah. So skin symptoms were reported in 65% of the reactions. Respiratory and GI system involvement were each reported in 30% of the cases. And no student uh, was reported to have experienced any kind of cardiovascular issues. Now this was the management. So this is an interesting slide. So there were 20 total students and antihistamine was used in all of them. Epinephrine was used in five of the students, administered by the nurse in all five cases. Uh, the student themselves had epinephrine, three of them, and then the epinephrine in the nurse's office was from two of them. The personal epinephrine was four, and stock was used in one case. And then um, all five that were given epinephrine were transferred to the emergency department via ambulance. All right. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about policies in schools. So policies is really, really a very important issue and very, very difficult also. So, you know, I'm often asked about what policies do I think are best for a school? And it's such a difficult question for an individual to answer because as a, as a researcher, you know, the best way to answer a question like this is by asking the, a large, quantity of people and getting a consensus. And so that's really what we wanted to do because currently there was not a lot of data on what policies are currently available and which ones actually are working or beneficial and what do the schools feel about this and what do 
parents feel about this. So backing up a little bit, you know, we have been fortunate in the world of food allergy to have some large policies passed on a national level, the School Access to Emergency Epinephrine Act, federal legislation that incentivizes states to adopt laws allowing schools to have stock epinephrine auto-injectors. Now, what we know about food allergies in schools and the couple studies that have been done on this is that approximately 18% of children with food allergies have experienced an allergic reaction at school. So about one in five kids with a food allergy have had a reaction in their school. And what we also know is that about 25% of first-time anaphylactic reactions occur at school. So about one in four kids who have never had anaphylaxis before um, are having it for the first time in school. And this makes sense because this is a place where people are, are trying uh, foods for the first time um, and experiencing you know, these new foods as part of their diet and then potentially realizing that they may be allergic. Okay, so current uh, school policy approaches, schools adopt varying policies to address food allergy, schools provide nut-free foods, um, a lot of the policies are around nuts specifically, um, they encourage families not to bring nut products, they designate, designate nut-free lunch tables, and often they ban outside food from coming into the school. However, removing all allergens in school is difficult. It's very important to reduce exposure and educate, educate, educate faculty, staff, students, regardless of whatever policies they have in place. Now, we have no allergen detector right now. You can't go through a detector and it'll tell you if you have it on you. And kids are going to bring all kinds of stuff to school. So it's always a challenge for all of us to, to figure out what is, you know, the best policy to keep kids safe in school. So I'll get into the first study we did. Now, this is the one where I told you, you know, I wanted to understand from nurses, from school administrators, and then from parents, what policies they currently have and what the effectiveness of these policies are. So this is a survey where we surveyed the parents of children with food allergy to determine current school allergy policies that are in place. And then again, the need and effectiveness of these policies. So an electronic survey was disseminated to parents of children with food allergy in grades one through 12. We did this from August, 2016 to January of 2017. Parents were recruited through the Allergy and Asthma Network and through uh, the Mothers of Children Having Allergies listservs. Data was collected on family demographics, allergic reaction experience, current school food allergy policies, the acceptability, effectiveness, and feasibility of current policies and desired food allergy policies. So overall, we had 289 parents respond. The majority of the parents were mothers, 91%. 70% of these kids were in, in elementary school, so grades one through five. 78.6% of these children attended a public school. So majority public, majority elementary. Uh, and the majority, it was a pretty decent distribution, but the majority lived in the Northeast or Midwest. The most common food allergen that was reported by the parents was peanut and tree nut. 82% of the children never experienced a severe reaction in the school setting, which means that 18% of the students had experienced a reaction at school. Okay. So here, now you can see, we're gonna go into policies in specific areas. So these are lunchroom policies. So 63% of schools had a designated lunch area for children with food allergy. Of those that did not, 32% of parents expressed that they needed this policy. So still there were, so of the, you know, almost 40%, 30% wanted some kind of policy in the lunch area for children with food allergy. Now, 85% of parents believe school lunch menus should provide allergen information. And this was really fascinating. So only 34% were aware that there was a policy in place for lunch menus to provide allergy information. So that's really a bit scary that only one third of parents thought that allergy information was provided on lunch menus in these schools. 
the next was that 80% uh, of parents wanted food items to be labeled with allergen information. And again, these are just general food items that are, are um, offered in the school for sale. And um, only 12% thought this policy was currently in place. We can go on to classroom policy. So about half of the schools the parents were reporting had current guidelines for celebrations, birthdays, and holidays in the classroom. Um, of, of the people who had it, 90% thought this was a very helpful policy, and 80% thought it was needed if they didn't have it currently. So that's another area that is really, really important to have specific policies for the classroom, especially in those elementary grades where oftentimes they they do eat and stay in one classroom the whole day. The majority of parents, 71%, reported that training and education for students was not taking place. So um, the majority of schools are not doing any specific training for students, which, as we all know, is a very, very important part um, of food allergy education to help decrease bullying, especially, but also to make your friends more aware and more supportive um, and more helpful with um, their peers with food allergy. And then a small percentage, about 5.6%, reported that there was any educational materials in the classroom related to food allergy. And we know this is true, but this may be another area that we do need to, to work on, is how do we get educational information into the classrooms and education to students without food allergy? Now, we did look at private versus public school associations, and they were pretty much as we would expect. Of course, private schools with more resources um, are more likely to have epinephrine available in the classroom, implement stricter food allergy guidelines when food was not provided by the school, train students and educate them on food allergy, and distribute more educational materials on food allergy. Um, public schools were more likely to have designated lunch areas for students with food allergy, and provide allergen-free meals to students. Now, the differences are potentially based on variances in financial resources, staffing, time availability, and level of school nurse coverage, which we know is an issue in many places. Now, there were some age associations. Policies tend to be age-appropriate based on self-management capabilities and ability to minimize personal risk. So what that means is that more students were allowed to self-carry epinephrine in high school and middle school as it compared to elementary school. And then elementary schools have a higher rate of designated areas in the lunchroom for children with food allergy compared to high school. They're more likely to have snack policies in the classroom than high school, and they implement stricter food allergy policies for celebrations. All right. I uh, hope everyone's still with me. It's... Uh, I know I'm not able to, to see you or take your questions, but we'll just keep going um, and we'll do questions in a little bit, but please uh, please keep them because I would love to answer them. So the next is the parent's perspective on school food allergy, or sorry, the conclusion of this is that one in four parents did not feel school was safe for their food allergic child. Um, many parents were unaware of food allergy policies that are already in effect in their children's schools. Um, parents expressed desires for lunch and food labels, a need for stock epinephrine, need for education of school staff and students on food allergy management, and more policies in place for, for field trips and after school activities. Significant policy differences between student, age, public and private, and region of the country. Okay, so how did that, this compare to what the nurses told us? So. We did a very similar survey um, with some slight differences to inquire about nurses or administrators, most of the responses were nurses, uh, school nurses, on what they currently had in place for food allergy policies, and then again, what they thought about them. So similarly, an online survey was disseminated around the same time period, and data was collected on school demographics, current policies, acceptability, effectiveness, and feasibility of current policies and their desired policies. So demographics, we had 242 total respondents. 96% uh, pretty much were school nurses. 
88% worked at a public school. 88% of schools reported a nurse working on site five days a week, which is amazing. So it may be a slightly skewed sample because we know that is definitely, unfortunately, not the case in um, many places. Um, peanut was, again, the most frequently reported allergen by the nurses. And in the past year, now this is really interesting to me, in the past year, 32%, so one in three of these nurses uh, reported at least one severe allergic reaction in their school, while 34% reported one or more severe allergic reactions happening uh, in their school. So I think that is a very important statistic that we should use, saying of school nurses completing the survey, a third had experienced a severe allergic reaction in their school in the past year. Okay, so let's get into what they um, they felt. So staff training policies. So 97% of these nurses uh, reported staff training on allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. And that's fabulous. So this these are our wins. So now it seems that more and more schools are doing training on allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. And similar amount of nurses, the 97%, reported epinephrine auto-injector training. So they are having training on how to identify reactions and how to use an epinephrine auto-injector. Now, um, the barriers were most commonly lack of staff education and time and administrative staff resistance. Okay, school-wide policies. So now 82% of school nurses uh, reported that emergency stock epinephrine was available. So that means that there's still, you know, that 18% that did not have stock epinephrine available. 84.3% no noted that stock epi was stored in the nurse's office. Um, again, similar barriers, or time and money and some resistance. Um, then 79% uh, of respondents reported that students were allowed to carry their own medication. 51% reported that their schools had allergy awareness programs and events. So half of them were having some type of programs and events or allergies, specifically food allergies. And, uh, and that was, you know, higher than what the parents were telling us. Okay, so classroom-specific policies. 62% reported that there are strict food allergy guidelines in the classroom. Um, so that's slightly higher than what the parents were telling us, but relatively consistent. 68% um, reported that there are strict food allergy guidelines for students. Parents are telling me somewhat closer to 50. Lunchroom policies, 84% reported clear cleaning procedures for the lunchroom. 62% reported designated areas for students with food allergy to sit and eat lunch. And then 88% were reporting that there was training of lunchroom staff about food allergies. So the conclusion uh, for the, the um, school administrators, primarily nurses survey, was that specific Policies vary according to factors such as age of student body and school nurse presence. Policies are generally favored by nurses. However, implementation may be hindered by lack of resources, time, or resistance by parents and staff. And identification of effective school food allergy policies and consistent implementation may lead to improved outcomes for students with food allergy. Specific policies vary according to factors. And I, I think this is similar to what I just said. I apologize for that. Um, I think what is really interesting is there were, was some concordance um, between parents and nurses. However, there were some differences. So 53, almost 54% of parents reported their child's school had stock epinephrine available, while 82% of nurses reported uh, emergency stock epinephrine policies in their schools. 24% uh, of parents did not know if this policy was in place. So if you add that to the 53, you're getting closer to the 82% the of nurses. Um, only 34, 35% of parents believe that there were school lunch menus with allergen information available, whereas almost 65% of nurses reported this policy in effect. Um, so again, I think these are important, very important issues 
uh, for parents to even be educated on or aware of. Future direction with this is to maintain an ongoing dialogue between parents, school administrators, pediatricians, allergists, school staff, to keep everyone informed of school pol policies in place. Work to standardize food allergy protocols nationwide so that we decrease the variability in school policies and to address the common barriers to implementation, such as lack of resources, time, and resistance from staff. Some recommendations for policies. The main one would be to increase availability of stock epinephrine in school. Um, it's pretty high, but we can get it higher. Uh, decrease exposure by improving the labeling of all foods in the lunchroom. This seemed to be a big hole that uh, was identified by both parents and by uh, school nurses. Maintain accessibility to allergen-free foods for students with food allergy. For training programs, include nurses, staff, and students in training centered around food allergy awareness. We really need more education. Share videos, educate, and conduct mock drills in the school to ensure emergency preparedness in case of anaphylaxis. And fo focus on the location and use of epinephrine autoinjectors in the building. Make sure they're accessible in case of an emergency. Uh, and utilize reporting systems for better accountability. Oh, sorry. I apologize. I was reading it without advancing it. Okay. I'm going to get into um, some, you know, that one big hole about education. We heard that a lot. Um, we continue to hear that a lot. How do we educate peers? And it's so critical to educate peers. Um, we, you know, have gotten so much feedback in some of our surveys. Uh, by the way, the last study I mentioned is published now in, in the Annals of Allergy in case uh, anybody wants to, to take a look at it or, or wants it. And then I'm happy to also send it out. Um, we published another paper on, on food allergy in adolescents, and in that manuscript, we really, really uh, identified a couple things for adolescents, and one of the biggest things was peer support. If they have peer support, and I think this goes for all, all students, the more peer support they have, uh, the better their potential outcomes. Um, peers supporting them, making sure that they're safe, uh, helping them identify foods that may be dangerous for them, all of that really, really helps students with food allergy. And so we tried to think of what we could do to, to assist with this. We decided we needed to create some simple videos uh, for students. And we did this with the help of students with food allergy. Um, we asked, we did an initial survey to ask students about what areas they would want their peers to know about. And these are the, the main areas that they told us. It was common food allergens, signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis, cross contact, steps to using epinephrine auto injector, reading labels, and support from peers. And they differed a little bit because we did this for elementary, middle, and high school kids. So they differed a little bit based on the age, but those were some of the major themes. And through that, we were able to create um, three videos, and this paper is currently accepted for publication, but these videos, we did one for um, K through third grade, one for middle school students, and one for high school students. And these are free um, on our website, which I'll, I'll show you at the end, but we also have put them on thumb drives, and we are happy to mail those out to anyone who wants it, again, for free. Um, this, All of this, um, the, the papers that I just discussed were projects that were um, supported, uh, and some of the funding came from Allergy and Asthma Network, so I do want to thank them for the work they're doing in this area. Now, I'm going to attempt to play one of these videos for you, if it will play, and if not, I may keep going until, uh, oh, yeah, here so we go. Are you? You guys for a little bit, a little bit, yeah, for sure. Hi there. I'm Matt, and I'm allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. Other common allergens are egg, milk, wheat, soy, thin fish, and shellfish. About two kids in every classroom has a food allergy. So we made this video to help you learn about it. Um, excuse me, do you know if this popcorn has any peanuts in it? It's nut-free, safe for students with allergies. Great. Matt, it's not free. 
yeah, I can read. Hey guys, why'd you ask about peanuts in the food? Hey Jason, we asked his mass allergic to peanuts. Oh, I don't really understand food allergies. Is that kind of like being allergic to cats? Kind of, but it can be a lot more dangerous. Yeah, whenever I eat a peanut or any food with a peanut in it, I can get really red and itchy and have hives all over my body. Sometimes it can even get hard to swallow or breathe. Yeah, being friends with Matt has taught us a lot about food allergies. Well, that sounds pretty intense. Well, you know, it's hard to avoid peanuts 24-7. That's why I carry my epinephrine with me everywhere I go and always double-check the ingredients in all my food. Hey, guys. I brought some cookies, and I made some without peanuts for you, Matt. Thanks, Catherine. Oh, by the way, some of the other girls and I are going to go to dinner on Friday. Do you guys want to come? Where are you guys yeah. going? We haven't decided yet. We're trying to find a place where Hannah can go that's good with her egg allergy. It sounds good. We could come by after basketball practice. Yeah. Matt, are you feeling okay? No. I think I'm having an allergic reaction. Oh, my God. It must have been the cookies. I'll go call 911. I'm feeling really hot right now. Matt, do you, do you need your Epi? Is it in your bag? This is Matt, can you give it to yourself? I'll do it. Can that go through his pants? Yeah, oh, I just forgot to take the blue safety cap off. Make sure you hold it for three seconds. Help is on the way. Feel better? You look so much better, Matt. I'm already feeling better. Oh, I feel awful. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault, Catherine. Even if you were really careful, there still could have been some cross-contact. What's cross-contact? It's when a peanut or something else you're allergic to touches your food, but you don't know it. I'm really sorry again about the cookies. I'm just glad that you're okay. It's okay. Thanks so much for giving me my epinephrine. Yeah, no problem. We know how important it is to use right away. What does epinephrine do? It's a medicine that helps your body recover right after having a reaction. Yeah, it's pretty easy to use. Matt's hot us just in case he can't do it himself. But it's always important to make sure that you have two. Oh, the ambulance is here, but you look so much better. Yeah, I feel better, but I still need to go to the emergency room whenever I use my epinephrine. I'm going to just pause it there. Um, try to get back to... There we go. All right. Um, it's a little bit longer, but for the sake of time and so I can get to your questions, I would like to just give you an example. I hope that played well. I'm, I couldn't tell completely on your end. Yeah, it looked, um, it looked so, good, Rishi, no problem. Okay, all right, good, good, good. All right, so some celebration um, safety for food allergy. Uh, it's so important to um, have snack-free celebrations when possible. I think more and more schools are going to this. Uh, no homemade treats in the classroom. You know, no home-baked cookies like in that video. Emphasize the activities, not the food crafts, games, and fun. Use non-food treats whenever possible. Stickers, trinkets, uh, always have an epinephrine auto-injector on hand. And with that, I think I'm almost to the end. I just wanted to let you know, uh, we are sponsoring a Midwest Faces Conference, it's a food allergy conference on education and science. Um, we're trying bringing together families and physicians. So the families conference is two days, Saturday, the 9th and 10th of June in Chicago. Hopefully the weather will be warm by then um, at Lurie Children's Hospital in Northwestern. And uh, we have a great lineup of speakers. Please go to MidwestFaces.com for more information. We're also having a, a, a physician conference, physician and school nurses, um, and anyone who cares for uh, food allergic children, um, but a little bit more clinically oriented on Sunday from one to six. And with that, I wanted to say thank you. This is the website, teamsoar.com. You'll find all the videos on that website uh, if you um, are interested in using them or, or passing them on. Again, you can contact us and we would be happy to send you one um, so you don't have to go on the internet to view it. And then I'm happy to take questions. That sounds good. I've got quite a few questions here for you. So if you want to go oh, back to the okay. slide with your uh, address on it, that way if people need to write okay. it down, they have a few minutes. So uh, our first okay. question, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, which is fabulous. Uh, what, the first Great. question is, why do you think kids are not getting diagnosed with food allergies necessarily? 
Yeah, that is a really great question. So um, what we are seeing, so when we ask the, the questions um, in the national survey, uh, we get what food they're allergic to and then their symptoms, and then we take it through an expert panel to see if the symptoms match up. It's so hard, you know, without oral food challenges to know, you know, if someone truly has an allergic reaction. And so it's very, very challenging. But what so what we do glean from that is some of these kids who are not reporting a formal diagnosis yet have very, very accurate symptoms um, and really look like they have a food allergy. And I think there's a couple reasons they're not getting diagnosed. So what I hear sometimes from families is they have other conditions that are more important. And when they had a reaction, when they ate the food, they just avoid it. There's no treatment for it. So it's not like asthma where they really need their inhaler. Um, with food allergy, you really do need your epinephrine auto injector, but um, there's no medications you can take on a daily basis, like with allergy or a controller med for asthma yet. I, I say yet because, you know, there are treatments um, on the horizon. But a lot of families that we hear from, they just say, you know, my kid also has asthma and other things, and I don't never mentioned it because we just avoid the food. So there's nothing they can do for me, right? <laughs> and so um, my guess is there's not enough awareness or, or families don't have time or some families don't have proper access uh, to get that formal um, diagnosis and ideally you know, from an allergist and proper testing. Um, we also find that a lot, of, a lot of kids who do see their pediatrician and are referred to an allergist never end up going to an allergist. And we see this a lot of times in our Medicaid population. And it may be because of a lag. Um, oftentimes it takes us a very long time to get those kids into see an allergist. And then it may be because of their busy lives. Um, they often don't go to specialists. Uh, a lot of families just don't go to the specialists when we send them to specialists. So um, a variety of reasons, but that's a really great question. And I think we need a lot more research into better understanding those barriers that they face to getting a physician diagnosis. So Rushi, a lot of people are asking for the report of allergic reaction form that they saw in the presentation today. And they're wondering if they want to get one of those from you, how do they reach you? Do, can they go to the oh. teamsorg.com and, and reach you through there? Or how would that be the best way to get that? Yeah, they absolutely can. And um, that may be the best way. And I'll, I'll totally send it out. I, I'll make sure that we post it on our website itself as a downloadable document. Is there a way, Sally, I can also send it to you and when you post the webinar, you can attach it? Sure. I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Okay. We'll put it right. So we'll do all link. three. We'll, we'll make yes. sure everybody we'll gets it that wants it. How's that? Our next question That's is, me. are there any parent questionnaires that we can use to help identify what kind of accommodations may be needed for their child? Oh, parent questionnaires. That is a great question. And this is what I love about these things is you're giving me ideas to work on. <laughs> so a parent questionnaire for what kind of accommodations the child may need that a parent can fill out and share with their school. I mean, I know in schools they go through the whole 504 plan, but that's very generic, but something very specific to food allergy. I'm not aware of any, but um, I will definitely put that on my list and I will search for it and see if I can find something without reinventing the wheel. Otherwise, we'll work on trying to develop one. We can do it together. The next question yeah. is, the data that states 25% first-time anaphylaxis at school seems to be old, maybe from 2010. The small study you recently did in schools, did that show first time ever at school that high? Oh, that's a very good question. And you're totally correct. So. Um, the study that we did at school, um, of those, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember the data of how many had their first time anaphylactic reaction in the school. Of the 20, what did I say it was? It was, I wanna say, I'm not, we have that data, but I don't wanna misquote. So I would have to go back and take a quick look. Um, I can tell you, we did a study in CPS um, that we published. And that's we Chicago, Chicago that, Public Schools is what CPS Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, with the third largest public school system in the country. And we did find of in year one of our having a epinephrine, stock epinephrine, um, 
half of those kids actually had never who who received the stock epinephrine. Now, I can't guarantee it was done, you know, for anaphylaxis. But of the kids who did receive stock epinephrine, um, half of them had never been diagnosed with an allergy, and it was their first time um, having an event that required the epinephrine. So it's a really good question. What does that number look like? How many kids are having their first time reactions in schools? And I don't know if that number has been uh, replicated after that. Was that was Massachusetts data. They do, they do uh, a report every year. So we should be able to find that updated. The next question is, mm. is there ever a need for students to not sit in the cafeteria due to a parent claim of anaphylaxis with smelling the allergen? In this case, it's peanut. What's the incidence of anaphylaxis with smell versus touch and ingestion? Wow. So that is a that is a very tough question with so much controversy around it. Um, the couple studies that have been done um, by Scott Shisher have found that smell smelling um, does not cause anaphylaxis um, because if you think about the mechanism, it's the protein that needs to get into the body. So unless smelling may, in, in the couple of instances. Um, that have been reported around smell. It's been some some intense in, instance, like a, a pressure cooker type of a function um, where the protein actually got in the air. But the problem with this is it's so hard to measure or test this. Um, and so there's very, very few studies that have looked into smell. Um, touch, now if you touch it and you don't have any broken skin or eczema um, or excoriations, then by touching it, you should get a local reaction. So you should not get anaphylaxis, um, again, if your skin is intact. Uh, touch should cause a local hive or local rash or local swelling. Um, and then the most common and frequent way is actual ingestion of your allergenic food because you're ingesting the proteins into your body. Now, I, I know there's a lot of controversy around it, so I'm not at all saying that it can't happen. I'm, again, as a researcher, just telling you what the data shows. Um, and this is really important, especially for older kids. But the other thing I do want to point out is the problem with food allergy today is that we do not have any kind of a severity spectrum. So I can't tell you that you're low, like in asthma, you know, you're low intermittent and you're severe, you know, and so you probably will never have a issue because your threshold is high enough with, you know, being around a food, whereas these severe food allergic kids may have, you know, a higher chance of, of anaphylaxis. So those are all things that researchers, including our lab, but amazing researchers all around the country are really working on um, trying to develop something where we have a better predictor for who that person is or that kid is that um, may be at higher risk. Okay. I hope that answered. I hope it does too. A couple of people have written in and said that NASN, the National Association of School Nurses, has a good parent questionnaire on their website. And we actually have a question for you next, oh, Dr. Gupta, from Seoul, South Korea. And someone is listening oh. and says that the the epinephrine, uh, the EpiPen injections says that you're supposed to hold it for three seconds, but the instruction box still says 10 seconds. Which one should be followed? Wow. Okay. So if they're using the new brand of EpiPen, then three seconds should be fine. Um, this is really interesting because it did go from 10 to 3 um, after some manuscripts were published, but the actual epinephrine is released within a second, typically. So even the three second, or now AviQ, the other um, manufacturer, is down to two seconds. Um, it's really for safety reasons, but the epinephrine from all those auto injectors are released within the first second. Okay, well, that's great. And, oh, let me just oh. tell you also the other good thing about not holding it in that long, and one of the reasons they did change it is because um, they were seeing that, especially in young children who move around, um, they could have a risk for lacerations, right? Because you're holding a needle in them and they're moving around. So that was another reason to reduce it to the three seconds. 
Okay, think, sorry, Sally. That's okay. There was a lot of concern about that, I remember. Uh, the couple things I just wanted to, somebody asked about uh, if, if the network had information on, on classroom or lunchroom um, issues with food allergies. And I would just like, in a minute, I'm going to show you a picture of it, but, but we do have a resource called um, uh, Aller called Allergy and Anaphylaxis, a Practical Guide for Schools and Families. It's a free download on our site, and I'll show you that in just a minute. And the other thing I wanted to make our listeners aware of is that uh, just within the last two weeks, the Allergy and Asthma Network has posted on our site a steps to stock uh, epinephrine toolkit to help you fully implement stock epinephrine in your schools. We had a U.S. Anaphylaxis Summit last week, and, and we were so pleased that Dr. Gupta could join us at that. But we were talking about how very important it is to fully implement stock epinephrine in your schools. And if you go to our website, allergyasthmanetwork.org, and if after that you put a slash school stock epi, you'll find a whole toolkit of how to help you really get uh, that fully implemented in your school. Because stock epinephrine is saving lives, and we want to make sure that every child is allergy safe at school with that stock epinephrine in place. So, Dr. Gupta, if you could go two slides forward, please. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your wonderful words. You are always just so, you, you reach people on such a great level, and we so appreciate all the work that you do and that you'll continue to do. So, thanks for being with us today. And we'd oh, like our... Of course. Oh, we love it. No, I was going to say thanks for everything you do, uh, Sally, and the network. It's, it's a really uh, amazing partnership. I agree. So I would like to have our listeners plan to join us next month for our May webinar, where we're going to be joined by Dr. Gary Stevens speaking on steroid overuse and asthma. That will be on May 24th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthma.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. This is also where you can watch all of our archived webinars, including this one, within about 48 hours. So if you need some information again, you will be able to not only see this um, webinar, but any of the others that we've had. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. This is a picture of our school guide. Uh, it's uh, our allergy and anaphylaxis guide for schools. This is very, um, very uh, informational. It's got great sections for uh, families, for school nurses, for schools. And it talks about, uh, it's got, got an allergy 101 to help you explain anaphylaxis to others. And uh, it's got a school safety guidance section as well as educational resources. This is a free download on our website. Go to the section for outreach and go to special publications. You will get a follow-up email from me uh, tomorrow, and it will have a link in there. And if you have any other questions, you can just go right ahead and email me back. So on the last slide, I'd like you to visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. For the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, this is Sally Schessler. We wish you a great and a healthy day as we work to breathe better together.